So hopefully I'm audible because this is the first time with a label mic. So yeah, hello everyone and uh, I'm Divya. I'm Savita. And uh, we're here to talk about burnout in the context of an open source ecosystem. Uh, primarily drawing from our references with the experience of burning out when we've contributed to open source projects and when we've been juggling them alongside our day jobs, the pandemic, and a lot of other stuff going on in our lives. So, um, so before we dive deeper into like our journey of burnout, we want to get started by introducing ourselves. Uh, Divya? Yeah, so as I already said, I'm Divya Mohan and uh, I am a technical writer at SUSA and that's my day job. But uh, over and above all the documentation work that I do at my day job, I'm also one of the documentation maintainers for the Kubernetes and the Litmus Chaos project. So that's, that's like a lot of documentation work I know, but uh, other than that, I'm also you know, involved in a bunch of uh, community related initiatives as part of my role um, of you know, an, an AWS community builder and a CNCF ambassador. So I, I'm extremely passionate about community-driven um, tech and uh, you know, helping people take their first steps in their open source ecosystem. And that's, that's just me. So why don't you go ahead? Sure. Um, my name is Savita Raghunathan, and I am a software engineer at Red Hat working on Kubernetes and OpenShift data protection. Before that, prior to that, I was working as a platform engineer, and I was creating platform as a service using Kubernetes and other uh, projects uh, that are like supported by Cloud Native uh, Computing Foundation. Along the way, I came across an amazing Kubernetes community. I fell in love with the Kubernetes community, and that's how my contributor journey actually started. I started contributing to SIG docs, and then I eventually ended up in SIG release, the, uh, the release team by SIG release, and I was there for like five releases. That's when I met Divya at 1.18 release, and then we were together for 1.22. I led the 1.22 release, and then right now I am focusing on the documentation project. So now that you have known a little bit about us and how we got started and what we are passionate about, let's move on to who we are not. So yeah, there's a fair disclaimer that we have to put out because none of us here are medical health professionals, neither are we studying to be one because let's face it, we've got a lot on our plate already. Um, so whatever we're speaking about right here is not medical advice and we'd request that if uh, you know, you're identifying yourself as someone suffering from you know, the symptoms of burnout, you talk to a medical health professional and get the relevant advice because that's what we did. So uh, with that PSA out of the way, um, let's look at why we're speaking about this today. So burnout is not a new concept uh, in the open source world. It's been prevalent since like early 2000s and probably even before that. It comes and goes in waves and why now? It's because we are at the peak of like one of those burnout waves along with the pandemic. Um, so this feels like the right time to talk about it and create awareness and uh, create more and more, uh, you know, like, uh, an environment where we could talk without any stigma attached, basically. So that's why we are doing it again. And right. And the, the whole thing about burnout is it's a very way abstract sort of a term. So when I actually went ahead and told, uh, you know, a couple of my close friends or people who I'm close to that I'm suffering from burnout, they're like, what exactly caused it? Is it like, you know, you're too stressed? Is it like you've got too much work on your plate? Or is it like, you know, just this whole pandemic thing that's going on? Or is it uh, plainly that you're exhausted and you just need to take a break? Because uh, anyone who knows both of us knows that we're total serial overcomers. Um, so it's a very vague term. And the reason why we actually really want to focus on burnout is because we um, want to have those, we want to start with those conversations wherein, you know, uh, we gain more perspectives, we have, um, we have this capability to develop a vocabulary around it, and we know that we can't do it alone, right? Like, as I said before, we are not medical health professionals. So even World Health Organization, which is supposed to be the premier world health, premier health organization in the entire world, ended up defining burnout as a syndrome just 
in this year, that is 2022. So let's have a look at what the definition is. So the World Health Organization, the WHO, categorizes burnout as a chronic stress from workplace, right? So we are all open source uh, contributors. We don't fall under that category, most of us. We are not paid to do the open source during our day job. So we love our community, so we do it during our own time. What happens to us? We are not even a part of that definition, like according to the definition, we don't even fall anywhere under that. And uh, most of us are like doing our day job and then doing open source work and we do it day after day, week after week, and we end up being, at least for me, I ended up being like, what am I doing with my life? Like, I don't have anything else. I just open my computer. I sit in front of my computer. I'm not getting my task done anyway. I'm just st staring at my computer. And even the shopping therapy is not helping anymore. And I'm like, at the end of the day, I'm like really sad. So that's one of the reasons that we want to create like, reach out and make sure that even the burnout in open source community gets addressed. Right. And it's totally okay if you did not listen to the past couple of minutes of us both rambling. So the TLDL version, I modified that a bit. So the TLDL version is that we want better vocabulary, we want awareness, and we want more perspectives to come in. It's as simple as that. Uh, because the more perspectives that you have, the more perspective, uh, the better conversations that you can have around it and you are you know fostering a healthy culture of having communication um, as a default rather than you know just when urgency crops up so in an open source ecosystem what tends to happen is you know we don't have a lot of um, you know these uh, open communication channels and uh, what is visible from the outside is what is is what is totally different from what is actually happening within the community and that's what Savita will sort of talk about in this slide yeah so let's see from a consumer perspective right like I the consumer can this can be an employer ABC wants to adopt a project and they have this new project proposal which uses the open source project X in this case and then they uh, uh, get approval, they publish their product, and uh, they deliver it and becomes a success, and that's about it. All they know is like they look at the project page, code, binaries, which they can use, and then the documentation website, right? What they don't know is like a lot of things that goes in the backstage. How about the licensing people who are wearing the license there and making sure that it's okay to consume and there is no legal implication? What about the infrastructure people who are maintaining the project writing test suites uh, and uh, making sure the project, every release is stable and reliable for someone else to consume, right? And same with the collaborators all around the world who are participating in the project, and they don't get recognized. All that, that the employer would see is like a code, and that is the only valuable contribution so far in most of the places. Most of the places don't recognize the other contributions as contributions at all. And that causes a lot of fatigue and for the people who are working on the other side, the backstage in this case, and um, they, there is like very less pool, like very less uh, stable pool of contributors in those areas where like folks can, you know, um, step up and go to the next level. Uh, that causes a lot of lack of motivation in the first place. And it doesn't just uh, stop there. Like we were talking to one, two of our friends uh, the other day at the co Contributor Summit, which happened on Monday. And there was this meeting, uh, SIG, SIG release meeting, and where they were talking about the role called a release manager, right? A release manager in this case is responsible for cutting the branches and getting the Kubernetes uh, uh, release out every single release. And they have more, uh, probably uh, responsibilities, and this is like the gist of it. And uh, they have the word manager and the role, right? And uh, I'm an engineer, and I want to be a release manager, right? My manager might question me, asking like, do you want to go in the manager line? Do you want to manage people? Because all they see is the manager word in it. Um, so uh, the commendable thing that the SIG release people are doing is they're going to change the role to a release engineer or something which can resonate more with the employer. More and more things need to happen. And it shouldn't just be the, uh, our onus shouldn't just be on the open source community. It should be on the employers or to encourage, like, it's fine, like, oh, you're contributing, which we are contributing, and how can we take this, and how can we use it? How can we 
we support you. That should be the ideology behind it. Right. And the whole part about, you know, open source contributions, um, you know, and where you start off your contributor journey is that it's exciting because it's not quite like what we experience when we start off at, say, a corporate setup, which all of us here are a part of, by the way, and most of us, at least, if I'm not wrong. So when we, op when we you know, start off on an open source contributor journey, typically what happens is it's a reflection change because you literally get to choose what you want to do given you know, the stage you are at, given the skill sets that you have. And um, what tends to happen is there is one thing that is probably as much of a barrier as a skill set that is sort of signing up for way too many things. And you should ask us both about that because we probably might write a PhD or a thesis about signing up for way too many things. It's literally something that we've done um, over the past couple of years and have regretted deeply because we are enthusiastic and we love the community and we love to contribute. And this particular thing is a double-edged sword. So as freeing as it can be, that is a very big double-edged sword hanging right over your neck. And it can possibly lead into burnout. Now, when we thought of this presentation and when we thought of you know, giving, out, uh, giving, out, giving, giving up the CFP, uh, we thought of how we could approach it. Because a talk has already been done about this before, but not in the open source context. And we had to narrow it down to the open source ecosystem. And we wanted for it to be a bit different in the context that we needed uh, you know, more open source stuff into the presentation. So we're going to approach this presentation from the perspective of three user personas, which is a, a contributor, a maintainer, and a community evangelist. And I know that there may be you know, several other personas, but these are the three broad personas that we have started off with. And we are extremely sorry if it's excluding anyone, but it was not our goal. It's just the thing that we are most experienced with. So sorry right at the onset if it is exclusionary. And we'll start off first with the contributor stuff. Let's get started with the contributor stuff. So how many of you here are a contributor or wanting to be a contributor or like thinking about it? Yeah, right? So we're all, right? And um, let's dive into it then. So there have been open source projects that have lived longer than uh, me, uh, successful projects, uh, Linux and other projects, right? But the birth of the Kubernetes led to something else totally different. It got adopted by a lot of company, and there was a lot of interest, and in the open source uh, contributions and open source became a buzzword, or at least that's when I came to know, so I'm like, I'm just going to say that. <laughs> so please pardon me if that is the wrong thing. Um, that created a lot of opportunities because the CNCF came along, adopted the Kubernetes project, and then like a lot of many little sandbox, more and more projects came along, and which means that you can contribute to any project you want. And even within the project, then you have like multiple roles, like, oh, you can do the docs, you can do the release, you can do the coding, and you can be the PM and whatnot. So a lot of opportunities, right? And when I started the Kubernetes, I faced with that same thing too. I, I signed up to be in release team. And I was like a SIG docs uh, shadow. And I was part of that, I was doing work with SIG documentation as well. And then I also signed up to, uh, to be a mentee in this uh, working group called Competence Standard, which is not a part of the ecosystem anymore because they achieved their goal successfully, so they dissolved the working group. Um, and there was also the SIG Country Bikes Contributor Experience, which had a triage, issue triage uh, group going on. So I signed up, to all, signed up for all of these things at the same time. And I also had a day job. So what happened after a while, <laughs> right? After a while, like I couldn't just keep up. I'm like, I'm just lagging one way or the other. I'm a perfectionist, so I hated it because I had to be on top of everything and I have to finish it and I have to like make it better. Like I don't like touching, like if I write a any piece of code, I don't like going back and touching it again, at least for an year or so because I want it to be so good that I want to focus on something else, really. So that did not help at all. And I had to pull out of some engagements and that hurt really bad. Why am I talking about this is that I want to uh, highlight that there are a lot of opportunities and there are a lot of challenges too along with that, right? And then comes the uh, contributors um, uh, located in anywhere in the world. Like when I want to contribute to Divya, right? 
um, it always happens during my lunch time or her dinner time, <laughs> cutting into our quality family time and uh, personal downtime, right? You can have it anyways. You can just take a nap or like you can just watch TV. You can do anything, but in, in that we choose to collaborate. We do things like asynchronous collaboration, but doesn't just cut out all the time and we are working on it. This is like one of the additional challenge as a contributor. And uh, this is when you have like informal mentoring programs within. But what when you know when you're a new contributor, absolute student, or you know even just a new contributor getting into uh, an open source ecosystem, and you see these n number of programs, internship programs like LFX internships, and we're not advertising by the way, just saying. So. Uh, you have Google Season of Code, Google Season of Docs, Outreachy, LFX internships, and I don't even remember the others, sorry, but you have all of that, and uh, you have to do your day job, and you have to structure it in a way that it doesn't sort of eat into your personal time. It's not possible. Take it from me because I was on the Google Season of Docs uh, for 2020, I worked with CERN. I also was on the release team shadow. I worked with, um, I think, Savita at that point in time. And I also was helping with SIG Docs. I was doing minor edits and I was doing a daytime job. And uh, that took a toll on me. And I'm not even kidding when I said it took a toll on me. It really did because I thought that, you know, um, every everything that I do within this space will, you know, be reflected on my resume, but it didn't. Uh, because I could not even end up completing half of it. Um, and it was like Savita, I uh, hated doing it. Uh, hated, you know, pulling back from the opportunities that I was given. And uh, the major thing why that happened, why I got into such a mindset was to actually, you know, curate my profile in a particular way, show that I'm a particular person, but that doesn't work. Uh, it honestly doesn't work because there's a lot of effort that goes behind every single project, every single community that you build. And um, if, if you actually try to curate your life, like with, you know, how it happens with Instagram, if you t try to turn your GitHub into a tech Instagram, it totally is going to fail majorly. Primarily because um, you take on a lot of things, you try to curate it in a way that is more, you know, apt for employers or potential employers to take a lead from, it is going to fail because you're taking on too much of work for yourself from that side. And I hate that I made it so negative with that last statement. So I'm going to, you know, go to how we got better. So we, um, so for at least for myself, because I'm going to speak for myself here. And uh, I realized that it's not a sprint. Like nothing in my life is a sprint at this point. It's going to be a marathon, if anything. And I'm going to pace myself. And this realization came very late. That was last year. Uh, I think mid last year was when I realized that. And it took a lot of um, you know, emotional exhaustion, uh, physical exhaustion, and the inability to drive anything, literally anything at work or in open source or at home, really, to completion. I could not do anything virtually properly that I, in the way that I wanted to. And that's what helped me because it sort of showed me the reality that, you know, you got to stop here because you're not doing anything well. You're just putting your hands in three different things and doing nothing of them, none of them right. So that sort of gave me a brutal, you know, flash uh, of light that, you know, you should stop here and you should take a step back and pause and reflect on what you actually want to be doing and what you actually want to be contributing to. And then, you know, the reassessing of priorities and stuff came up after. But that was my journey. And, why and, you and about for us? me, like many of you might have taken flight or some of the other way to come to the KubeCon. <laughs> and you have heard always, like if you have ever taken a f come a flew through a flight, you will just have heard that, like put on your mask before you help someone else, right? So I had to like do that because I started feeling emotionally drained, and more than that, I was emotionally unavailable for my loved ones, and that hurt me so bad, and all because of the things that I'm doing, and that is not right. So I had to like pull back from all the engagements that I had, and then I had to like make a short list. I'm not good with long-term list because I can never stick to one thing, and I keep changing for good. So I had to like short 
make a short list and then like figure out what I want. So I, when there was a sick, uh, sick dogs PR wrangler, and when they reached out to me, I said like I'm sorry, I cannot do it. Can you take off, take me off the list? And they were like kind enough to do that. And I said like I will start from scratch because whenever I'm ready, I will do it. And they were like more kind enough to say that no, no, when you're ready, let us know. We will put you as a reviewer because you have served that role for a while, which is amazing to know that stepping down or stepping back is not a step down. Right, like I took a step back, but doesn't mean that I lost anything. I'm still there. My place is waiting there whenever I'm ready. And the other thing is like um, self-care, which is very important. And I care for everyone else in my life, and I don't care for myself. Like I'm very harsh on myself. Like if I'm one hour late getting up, I'm like very mad at myself. So I had to relearn like how to be kind to myself, so that like I can focus on the actual stuff that is happening instead of just being mad at myself. And another thing is like communicating. Like I'm working on it. I'm getting communi uh, getting better at communicating. Like I work with this amazing SIG security folks, right? And I commit to so many things there as well. And I stumble, and I cannot do things. And I fall, and I message them in the Slack saying that, see, I couldn't do this because something happened. And sometimes I don't even have to give a reason, and they understand it. And they are like extending their support all the time by willing to help me. right? And that is what a community is. So if you are in a group that doesn't do it, you're in a wrong group. And if you are not doing it, you should start doing it. And you should advocate or tell your group to do that too. Like, we are all there for each other. It's like, you know, we, we have to look out for each other. There is no race. Like, it's not a race, to be honest. It's like all of us help, all of us succeed. And the, that is what the community is about. Um, and uh, when we speak about, you know, setting uh, stuff and having that community, uh, you know, health, uh, in such a way that you can actually communicate to your maintainers, it needs to have good people at the top. And by the top, I don't mean the top of the building. I really mean like the hierarchical top of the community. So according to us, at least, uh, in like the community, maintainers are typically the people who are able to foster um, and set goal, uh, foster a healthy environment. Of course, it's aided by com uh, contributors and the other people. But uh, maintainers are typically the people who actually help with uh, setting goals, setting expectations for their specific area, uh, and you know helping uh, the project go in a particular direction. So when you're a maintainer, you have that additional responsibility of um, not only uh, embodying the expectation and carrying out what you are expected to do, but you also have to actually, uh, you know, set that particular goal and ensure everybody else is living in an environment that can actually aid them to go towards that goal. And what happens when there's no goal? Like, what happens when there are no expectations at all? Uh, that's something that uh, Savita will talk about. Yeah, so what happens when there is no goal? It is, it, it leads to a chaotic environment, right? There would be a lot of in, a lot of features that so many people are working on at the same time, or like no feature at all, the project becomes stagnant. And like you don't upgrade, like for example, if it is a project that's supporting another project, like little mini tools that we use, the CLI tools is supporting a big project, we don't apply, up, update it, keep up with the big project with this moving at a speed of a bullet train, and the project's like pretty much dead. Uh, so, and you can also ask like, why should we set expectations? Because the contributors are doing it as a voluntary, most of them are doing it as a voluntary thing, right? How can you set expectations? Like, how can you expect them to do something? But think, think about it like this, like if you set little goals, right, little themes, like come up with themes for your releases, like say reliability, say like a security, say like documentation, say like five features goes in the release. That puts a lot less stress on the maintainer because they know that they have to only block like two weeks of their three month cycle uh, to review, to um, help the contributors and get the feature in. And the same with the contributors too. They know like they have two features to focus on. They can get the features done in the right way, and they can move on to the new one instead of like lingering, uh, like having like n number of features lingering, and then just keep it going for like 
God knows how long, like two, three years, or maybe maybe even drop out. So those are the little things that I want to highlight here. And, uh, and when we talk about you know these goals, and she spoke about it pretty well uh, in terms of you know uh, pacing out your work, you have to be sustainable about it as well because uh, you have to set expectations that are sort of community vetoed and not like working per your own schedule and um, if you uh, if in any community you're made to believe that uh, it's uh, you know the leadership uh, is just you know the first people who are at the helm of it all it's completely wrong because you know community all together um, uh, the people in the community all together are uh, responsible for the health of the community and when we speak about sustainability within the community aspect of uh, things you have to understand that even for a maintainer like she just said uh, for pr wrangler uh, reviewing role um, stepping down is not a step back because you are still there. You're still within the ecosystem. You're not going away, uh, going away anywhere, and that role will be there. Uh, it's not some. It's not going to go away magically because we open source is a voluntary thing and it will always require people. So uh, distribute, distribute your work. Help other people get up that ladder as well because. Who are we in a race with at this point in time? Why are we in a race in the very first place? Because communities don't race against each other. They walk together towards a particular goal. So there is no particular way of approaching burnout from, uh, you know, uh, a maintainer's perspective because, you know, it, it, it's an individual effort. But while fostering that healthy environment, it is extremely essential for the ment uh, maintainer to be cognizant that while setting goals, he, they, he, she, or they have to be really cognizant of the fact that those goals are sustainable in the long run and not just catering to their own, um, you know, cadence and their own comfort. So now that I have actually spoken about this uh, maintainer persona, um, we also want to, you know, touch upon the single maintainer persona. Yeah. So, like, there have been a lot of projects that has, like, very few handful number of maintainers doing it. One of the such things that I can think of recently is the Log4j, <laughs> if you can all remember about the security issue that happened, and the number of companies that's been using the Log4j. Like, my partner works in medical industry, medical devices, and he knew about it because they were using it in one of the medical devices, like, communicating some, somewhere, like, in the software. So what happened there, like a the lot of employers, like they wrote blog posts about it and then like a lot of people were like creating noise on the Twitter and they're like maintainers who were working hard to fix the problem. Uh, in addition to hearing the concerns from everyone around the world, right? That is not sustainable at all. Imagine how much guilty the maintainers would have felt that they are not able to meet the goals. Like guilt is not my friend, your friend, or anyone's for that matter in this case, right? So what the right action is that the employer, or like we could have all pulled at that moment and supported that community so that like we could have grown together or like we could have solved the issue together. That is one action. And we just want to call out like, it's really important to recognize that like sometimes it's just like one or two people doing it for like years and number of years i don't know i cannot do it so i'm hoping that that's not the case in the future like we all get very cognizant about it and we create uh, uh, like paths that where the new like people can go as a bird and then like mature into a like flower and like move on right so it should just be like a cycle um, now that we are talking enough about the contributor and the maintainer's uh, perspective, well, th let's move on to the community advocacy. Right. So this is going to be fairly brief because um, both of us are not like in, in the trenches of community advocacy. I'm a technical writer. She's a software engineer. And we both do our share of um, you know, documentation. But none of us is a full-fledged advocate here. So with our experience, what we've tended to note, what we've noticed is actually that uh, the technology ecosystem goes uh, goes by very fast, isn't it? Kubernetes itself has right now three, four releases at this point per year. So before it had even more. And this is just one project that we're talking about. There are many projects here in the ecosystem and they keep having these many releases and it's difficult as a community advocate or even just a particular projects advocate to 
understand or uh, you know figure out the number of changes that keep going in for each specific project and um, what tends to happen with advocates is that there are broadly three buckets wherein you know uh, a com contributor basically is just you know doing advocacy on the side a person who is not actively contributing but is you know uh, you know cre um, creating educational material or you know putting out podcast videos related to that project and a person who does both like juggles it really well i i know a few people who do it really well so kudos to them but it takes a toll on them because the ecosystem goes by really fast and it's on an advocate or on that person to assess and take back, uh, take a step back and understand that the kind of content that you put out and the kind uh, you know the pace at which you put out it put it out is it worth the cost of your own health is it really really important for you to churn out content week after week or can you like pace it maybe a little slower would that be okay and uh, that is extremely uh, uh, that is an extreme consideration that you have to make i mean have to take because it doesn't make sense if you know you are um, you know building your bridge which a community advocate is um, on very weak foundations because community advocates are supposed to be the bridges between the project and the wider world right at this point in time that's what we uh, associate community advocacy with so if you're doing that and you are yourself you know spreading yourself thin then there's no point in doing it at all because you are just going to either do it half heartedly or you are going to just you know uh, not do it at all or not be able to drive it to completion if you're anything like me so Rome wasn't built in a day, and it's best that if you take a pause and then press play, because otherwise, what tends to happen is that you're going to burn out at the speed of light. Uh, if there's a faster speed, I don't know if it was invented, but if there was a speed, uh, you're going to burn out at the speed of light, and that might not really be helpful or anyone involved. And with that. Uh, yes, so we hope we have created some awareness. We did set a goal uh, for us that if one of you who's listening to our talk here or virtually or anywhere after that, if you are motivated, inspired to speak about burnout uh, or even educate your uh, family, friends, at your work, at your employer, that means that we have achieved our goal. So that is one thing. And also I want to call out on the community that we, we as a community should come together and work on solving some of the issues that we have discussed. Or like they, there are multiple issues that's been already like going on. So we should like take this as an opportunity to discuss all those. Um, and we have linked some resources already, like familiarize with yourself with the burnout symptom, reach out to your fellow contributor, fellow friend, and like if you see them with the symptoms, check in. Some people did that for me and really helped me, so like do that. And we have some of the CNC resources too, so check that out uh, whenever you have time. Um, and to wrap it all up, to be honest, I know y'all have been pretty, uh, sitting here pretty long and it must be really taxing for you all to listen to us ramble for that long. So to wrap it all up, we know we haven't presented you all with a solution to a problem. But what we are hoping is the conversations that we have after this lead to that solution. And maybe it's not a midget, but as an ecosystem and as an industry, you know, in the wider sense, we need to have better ways of coping with burnout, better language to uh, seek that support. And uh, obviously that comes with, you know, being more inclusive and being more diverse about the perspectives that we are gaining. So thank you everyone so much for listening to us today. Thank you. And we hope you had a good time. If anybody, anybody got a question? We got... Oh, she, she was... Hi. <laughs> Hello. Hi. Thanks for coming to our talk. <laughs> no, thank. Um, we have met before on the internet. This is Celeste. Thank oh, you hey, so nice much. Hi. So, uh, because you are both SIG DOS contributors and because my last role with the CNCF was a staff technical writer with them, I wondered if you had any perspective on um, burnout that is unique to people working in documentation in open source. <laughs> Tell me the deets. <laughs> Okay, I've just been fairly recent, and this is not advice. <laughs> but I think, you know, uh, having, like, I 
really, really uh, find it hard when you know I uh, when I went through burnout last year when I was working with uh, dogs before I became the coach. Chair. So it was really difficult for me, and I had to put a hard stop for myself. It was not as easy as you know I said in the presentation. It was not as easy. I had to put a hard stop. I had to take a step back, and it is. It is. It's. It sounds easy when I say it right now, mm -hmm. but it is. Uh, you know, all about taking that decision of putting a hard stop for mm -hmm. yourself, and um, you know, stopping yourself from consuming all the content. Because as technical writers, I know that when we have to sort of uh, write about something, we have to do a lot of research. We have to write and review and do a bunch of stuff before we actually put out content uh, or docs or mm -hmm. whatever. So I understand that coming, coming from that side of things, it's very difficult. Mm -hmm. But it's essential if you're going through burnout or if you're on the brink of burnout that you take a hard stop, you mm -hmm. reflect on what you can consume, what might not be a complete information overload, and delegate that work to a much wider audience mm -hmm. rather than you know taking all the responsibilities mm -hmm. on yourself rather mm -hmm. than you know. It's, it's just going to be a lot of burnout at the mm. end of it all. So mm. I think delegating responsibilities and taking that hard stop is what worked for me. But mm -hmm. I am no expert on this. Like I said, I'm not a mental health professional. So I yeah. mean, thank you for your help with Stig Docs and with Kubernetes. It's been wonderful, ladies. Thank you. Thank you. Another question. Um, hi. hi. This talk has been amazing. Thank you for doing it. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, on one of your slides, there was a, a piece of advice that was, um, you know, set up structures so that people can ascend into leadership, give people leadership opportunities. And what advice would you have for maintainers who are trying to figure out a way to do that well? So I am going to take example of one of the things that Sig Docs did recently. Like one of their co-chairs were like stepping down, so they had a cohort of like a uh, six weeks or something where they train people. Um, and finally, they have like three amazing co-chairs right now uh, out of the program that came out of the program, right? And that is one thing. And sometimes it should, I feel like it should be ongoing. It shouldn't just be like one-off and it should always happen. Like there should be always someone who is in the training or like uh, set up a role, ask like someone might want to be a tech lead, right? But they don't know how to do it. And someone might be just interested in the topic, but they don't have the resources. It takes a lot of effort too, so I want to like, say to the maintainers that you also have to take care of your health. And uh, when you say that I'm going to like support this group, it's going to take a lot of effort, which means that you need a lot of people. Um, so like, take it bite by bite, you know, like one thing at a time. Um, so if running mini cohorts works, that works. That's about it. And then uh, try and expand it later to a full-fledged program when you have more contributors. Um, that's one thing that I can think of right now. When I think of more, I'll know to reach out to you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we got time for one more question. Go for it. Yeah, hi. Uh, hi. Thanks so much for the talk. I, I feel seen. <laughs> but uh, you spoke about guilt. Um, uh, what I wanted to ask was, so one really good thing right now is that there's a, a whole influx of new contributors coming in. So I'm from the Kubernetes community, so my mindset is that uh, I don't speak for like other communities. So there's a huge influx of new contributors coming in, and uh, it makes me very happy when they reach out, ask for help, how to get started, right? Uh, but at the same time, I'm also experiencing some of the symptoms that you described, and uh, there's this guilt of not being able to effectively help them get started in the community. And like I got started because of a workshop that Divya did, so thank you for that. <laughs> uh, but uh, you, like, uh, have you experienced uh, guilt in that manner in the community? And if so, what were your experiences with uh, dealing with it? Do you want to go first? Yeah, sure. Yeah. So basically, I uh, had a lot of guilt after that uh, summit, uh, not summit, open uh, Kubernetes Communities Day, Kubernetes Community Days uh, that we held in Bengaluru because a lot of people reached out to me after that asking for directions on how to get started. And it was physically, mentally, and energetically, I guess, impossible for me to do, uh, to cater to all of the requests. So what I did, to be very honest and very frank, is delegate, as I wrote in the previous slides. I delegated that to a lot of the 
older newer contributors i cannot i don't have a particular phrase for it but that's how i see them in my head so there are people who are in the community who have been around fairly after fairly new but they are not exactly entrenched yet and they've just started out their journey so it's an opportunity for them to pay it forward and they have that confidence because they've just started and they know a bit about how to get started and i'm giving them that opportunity as well to help another person so that wor worked very well for me and first off when i started it was extremely nerve wracking for me because i don't know if that person would actually you know listen to the second person or whatever so what i did was i initiated a group chat and i would do a check in if that person was okay and if he had if they or she or he had found their way and then you know if they had any problems i would ensure that there was some bridge between the two or a communication channel between the two where they could address that till they were comfortable or and all set to you know navigate themselves in the community so that's what i did and i i got to tell you at first it's very very you know you you feel a lot of guilt because oh my god i'm not helping someone personally but don't take it personally because it's not your fault it is nobody's fault that you can't help you have too much on your plate so if you have that you should delegate uh, and of course i won't tell you not to help but whenever you have a chance let others also take up the mantle let others take up the opportunity to help others because that's how a community grows there is no other way a community can grow